Damming the River Nile, Ethiopia's Prime Minister questions whether the largest hydroelectric project in Africa will ever see the light of day. It's years away from opening because of controversy and construction delays. And what about water shortages feared in neighbouring Egypt? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Elizabeth Peranam. The Grand Renaissance Dam being built in Ethiopia is planned to be the largest hydroelectric power plant in Africa. But the multi-billion dollar project, which Ethiopia says is vital for its future economy, it's dogged by dispute and delays. Egypt and Sudan also rely on the River Nile. Egyptian farmers fear they'll have less water to irrigate their fields. Ethiopian government leaders deny they'll cause water shortages. Talks have been deadlocked for months and leaders have vowed to iron out their differences peacefully. Egypt's Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri and Head of Intelligence Abbas Kamal met Ethiopia's Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed on Monday for the latest talks. Well, Ethiopia's Prime Minister is warning that the dam, in his words, may not see the light of day and blames a company run by the Ethiopian military for the delay. Uh, there's a problem in the management of the project. This is the case when it comes to all huge projects being executed here in Ethiopia. The local company who has taken the mission did not have enough experience. We had to do reforms because the projects are not being implemented according to the schedule. We have formed a committee to look into the problem of the delay in the Renaissance Dam construction in order to try to solve it. Well, let's take a closer look at the major construction project. Work started seven years ago and was expected to be completed last year, but only 60% has been built so far. Ethiopian taxpayers and bondholders and not foreign investors are paying the more than $4 billion price tag. It's in the vast arid Benish Angul region on the border with Sudan, around 900 kilometres northwest of the capital, Addis Ababa. It's planned to more than double Ethiopia's power capacity. Well, let's now get the thoughts of our guests. Joining us from Istanbul is Timothy Kaldas, non-resident fellow at TimeUp, focusing on political analysis. In Atlanta, Johannes Gedemu, lecturer of political science at Georgia Gwinnett College in Lawrenceville and a Horn of Africa specialist. And here in Doha is Harry Verhoeven. He's a professor of government at Georgetown University. A very warm welcome to all of you. Mr uh, Verhoeven, let me start with you. The Prime Minister saying the dam may not see the light of day. Um, is Africa's most ambitious infrastructure project in serious trouble? I actually don't think it is. I mean, the Prime Minister has indeed used this alarmist language both yesterday in his first public press conference, but also about a month ago in a widely reported on speech he gave to young people, which shocked the Ethiopian nation when details were leaked and emerged. And what has essentially happened is that, he, that the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam has become part of this power struggle that is still gone going in Addis Ababa, uh, which pits the Prime Minister and those who support him against a number of other factions of his party. And what the Prime Minister is, is trying to do is trying to essentially blame uh, the delays with which the dam is, is being confronted at the moment on one particular wing of, of the party and on the military, which has been seen to be backing this wing, by fingering METEC, which is a military industrial conglomerate that has been central to the construction of the dam. Uh, and in many ways, he's therefore trying to also warn the Ethiopian public if indeed you know, those thousands of megawatts of, of power that we have promised to and for which you have sacrificed so much don't come online immediately. Don't blame me, but blame my predecessors and blame the factions that have essentially been thwarting the progress. Now, the issue with this is not so much that it's, that it's wrong. I mean, it is true that METEC has been responsible for some of the delays but is that this, is, as an explanation, is incomplete. I mean, this is a very complex project. There are lots of actors who bear lots of responsibility for, th for, for some of the delays and things going wrong. And the key thing, as I said, to understand is that it's now part of this internal power struggle uh, and, and, and that this is now with bits and pieces emerging to the, to the outside world as a, as a serious problem. Mr Gedemu, what do you make of that? Is the project, is the dam in serious trouble or is Prime Minister Ahmed being a little bit alarmist here? Uh, I think what uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed is trying to do is very much uh, becoming, you know, honest and very much upfront about the development of this Grand Renaissance Dam. 
and not only just uh, trying to shift the blame towards his predecessors, but also admitting some fault in the government, government's management of uh, not only this uh, huge uh, mega project, but also other mega projects when it comes to uh, sugar corporations and, and, and all others. Uh, there is this huge scandalous, um, uh, uh, cor corrupt uh, kind of ways of doing and uh, investing in this uh, mega projects. And the public not only has invested its money, but also has invested a lot emotionally. Yeah. So when now, uh, you know, we have somehow this uh, very much open and uh, democratic kind of government taking power, uh, the, the public has now this uh, right, has earned this right to ask, okay, what's, what's up with this uh, project? When are they going to be finished? Um, and also, uh, just like um, uh, the friend just mentioned, um, there was this clear issue that a uh, few months ago, the prime minister said that uh, some of these uh, mega projects uh, who, who are delayed have been used just for political purposes. Some of them were not actually uh, going the way uh, the, the government owned media was reporting them, um, say 60 percent completed or 50 percent completed. So he, he actually said that it may even not be completed in 10 years right. if we are going in such, in such a way, in such a slow process. So now the public that somehow, uh, it could be misinterpretation of what he was trying to say, but the public started to ask, okay, when is it going to be done? So he is now, by saying that, um, uh, you know, just, just uh, speaking about it in the last few days, what he's trying to do is that to restore public trust sure. in this government project is, and that not only just blaming the other factions from his predecessors, but also now I am in control. But now I am the prime minister. Now I have this full responsibility of making sure these projects are implemented. M so it looks like that Prime Minister Abi is taking ownership of this whole responsibility. Mr. Carlos, let me bring you in now because the project is, of course, very important to um, Egypt as well. Egypt has been the main beneficiary of the Nile River traditionally up until now. And you've had the Egyptian uh, foreign minister and intelligence chief in Addis Ababa today on Monday meeting the prime minister, carrying a letter from President Sisi. What message will they be delivering? Well, I think that uh, Egypt right now has been trying to strike a more... Um, productive and constructive tone in terms of its uh, its relations with Ethiopia and it's expressing its concerns about the dam. We've seen that in the last year or so. And um, Egypt's uh, priority is to make the, uh, the, the progress move in a, in a fashion that is least damaging to its access to Nile water, um, which means filling the reservoir behind the dam as slowly as possible. Um, while the delays undoubtedly are upsetting for Ethiopians and, and, and frustrating for them, the one positive that I would, I would offer is that it gives more time for negotiations to yeah. proceed um, and for a solution to be found, which is pretty important. We've had a lot of uh, problems on that front uh, in the past several years. Egypt was going through a lot of transitions. Uh, the government's focus on foreign policy wasn't there for a while, um, and the dam project was launched in that context. Uh, and so now we have the situation where there's finally more attention being paid to this and Egypt is trying to speak with uh, Ethiopia and Sudan to find some sort of uh, arrangement that, that can work for everyone um, and at the same time uh, avoid uh, damaging its access to Nile water and its uh, ability to provide water to its people as well as maintain its agriculture. Mr. Verhoeven, do you think Prime Minister Ahmed's comments um, about the problems with the dam have offered Egypt, Egyptian mediators, um, more time to negotiate, uh, justifications to readdress some of these issues that they have with the dam? Has it been a gift to them? Perhaps a gift is a, is a strong word, but it's certainly true, as the, as the previous speaker rightly, rightly underlined, and indeed it, it allows the negotiations a little bit more time. Though in a sense it's also unfortunate because these past couple of years have been very good years, actually, from a rainfall perspective, and so there's actually been higher than average rainfall, which could have very usefully been, been stored without any effect whatsoever on Egyptian farmers, thereby reducing the, the, the period it would take to, to impound the reservoir. So in a sense, yes, okay, uh, it gives us a little bit more time, um, in spite of 
what Mother Nature is, is, is doing. It allows uh, Egyptian negotiators and e Ethiopian negotiators to, to try to work out things. But the, the fundamental problem remains, of course, a problem of, of trust. It's not that these two sides haven't been talking to each other. They've been talking to each other for more than, for more than five years at a very, very high level, heads of state level, heads of government, heads of intelligence, foreign ministers, technical committees, etc. The problem fundamentally is, as I said, one of, one of trust, one, not one of, of technical details. Yeah. And there the question is whether another 12 months or another six months or nine months or whatever it may be uh, can actually allow us to, to bridge that gap uh, in, in, in terms of trust. And there, unfortunately, I remain skeptical because as much as this as a multilateral solution, a solution between all parties, including Sudan and other upstream countries, is necessary, I still feel, unfortunately, that it's quite unlikely. Mr. Gedamu, how do you overcome that sort of lack of trust in determining how the river's water, uh, the river's water is going to be shared? Um, that's an excellent question, Elizabeth. I, I believe that what really matters is this question of until when uh, the such negotiations will continue, right? And for how long? Uh, because this project is ongoing, uh, the construction is continuing. Of course, there are certain problems in the Ethiopian side that may be somehow a blessing in disguise for the Egyptians. But at the end of the day, things will come, come down and the construction will commence. And then the filling of the reservoir, as you just, as you just mentioned, it becomes you know, a, central, a, a central focus. Um, and what I think uh, should happen is building trust and making sure that, just like about 1999, when the countries, about nine countries, including all the upper Nile drainage countries and including Egypt and Sudan from the lower, uh, the lower uh, level drainage countries, signed that cooperative fr framework agreement, which was then abandoned by Sudan and Egypt, that was all about developing this water resource for the benefit of all the region. And just like that, if the Egyptians actually look at the, the water uh, 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 you know, resources that Ethiopia has, they may ask, OK, Ethiopia is the water tower of Africa, but why is it so important for her to actually build this dam? There is one thing that's very much clear. According to the 2016 World Cup data, Egypt has 100% coverage. Egyptians have 100% coverage of electricity. What about Ethiopia, which is the second most populous nation in, in the continent, which is about 15 or so million people uh, more than Egypt? Only 43% of Ethiopians have access to electricity. Even that access is very much limited because of interruptions and so many other uh, issues because of very, very uh, undeveloped uh, and weak grid structure. So what I think is that Egyptians must actually claim that, OK, we are an Arab, uh, an, an Arab nation, so we have this Arab identity, but also we have this African identity. So they should be mindful of this African identity and the need to work with others, right, to trust their African brothers and sisters and make sure that we are in this together. We also want you to actually benefit from this. That's but we want, we want this process to be transparent. So I think that what Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed is trying to do is not only becoming very much honest with the citizens in the countries that he leads, but also with Egyptians, with the Sudanese. And the only problem that I see with Egypt is that their approach sometimes could be, I believe, that motivated by some panic. Uh, we all know, I think Al Jazeera has also, had also reported uh, a month or so, a uh, few months ago, uh, the deployment of troops in Eritrea. But somehow that evaporated because of the historic uh, peace accord between Ethiopia and Eritrea. And we all remember. Mr. Gedamu, you of have raised a lot of uh, you've raised a lot of interesting points, and I can see the other guests wanting to uh, come in on them. Mr. Verhoeven, I am going to get to you in just a moment, but before I do, Mr. Kaldas, I do want to ask you what you're making of uh, what we're hearing from Mr. Gedamu. Does Egypt need to uh, be less panicked and have a more sort of pan-African approach to this dam and look at how it's going to benefit the other countries of Africa, like? Ethiopia that have uh, that you know suffer from po constant power outages. Well, I don't think that uh, Egypt should necessarily be less panicked. I mean, it's a very urgent matter for them. The uh, you can, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't mean to uh, belittle the, the the challenges that Ethiopia faces. Power is very important in the modern world, but you can live without electricity. You can't live without water. Um, 
Now, it's absolutely essential for uh, partners of Ethiopia to support it in developing its power capacity. Um, at the same time, uh, the matter is quite urgent for Egyptians that their water access not be uh, significantly disrupted or, or reduced. Um, and any such uh, disruption could be very devastating for the population there. So it's understandable the level of concern and the urgency with which the Egyptian government looks at this question. Um, that said, it, uh, relations with Africa could improve dramatically. There's a lot of uh, a lot of work that needs to be done. There's a lot of things that need to be a lot of relations that need to be repaired and strengthened. The Egyptian government seems to st have started to to uh, realize this recently and uh, begin to take it more seriously. But that, I mean, it's still very early, and there's still a lot more they could do. Um, so I don't I don't uh, reject that prop that problem at all. I, I, I acknowledge that that needs to happen. Um, but I, I uh, as much as they they should care for other nations, every nation ultimately looks for its own interests and. The access to water question is is, uh, is paramount and vital for uh, for Egypt, and it's never going to cease to be uh, one of its most urgent uh, national uh, concerns and interests. Mr. Verhoeven, I uh, noticed you wanted to uh, get in earlier. What would you like to say? Just 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 two things. Uh, the first thing is I think that it's it's very important when we when we talk about about Egypt is about who's Egypt. Because, of course, the central question of the Nile waters in Egypt is, is, is a distributional question. The way in which agriculture in Egypt is structured is essentially is that you have a huge sector of very poor farmers who are barely uh, able to make ends meet. And on the other hand, you have these very, very big kind of agro-industrial concerns, often with ties to the military and the security, who are actually at the moment getting the bulk of the water. And so the, the key thing for, for Egypt is, is, is not just to stick to this national security question, this question of, oh, you know, we have to choose between you know, either giving Ethiopia power or giving Egypt water, but it's actually taking a long and hard look at the way in which, as I said, water is allocated inside Egypt, which is at the moment very deeply unfair and is actually a much greater impediment to the development of the country and the improving of its international standing than anything that Ethiopia has been doing. Mr. The, the second thing I want to I wanna, I wanna say that's, I think, important, because there was briefly referenced by Johanna to this, is this idea of, of potentially a regional war of Egypt and Eritrea and then Ethiopia, etc. Um, the, the key point to point out is, is this. You know, alarmist discourses about impending water wars or impending conflicts are not only factually incorrect, I mean, on the ground there was actually very little proof for any deployment of Egyptian forces on the Eritrean border or anywhere else, but it is once again, as I said, that they distract us from the real substance and the really difficult technical details of what an agreement between the different partners could look like. And so this is why it's important that both the leadership in Addis Ababa but also the leaderships in Khartoum and Cairo come to the negotiating table, stop trying to spin this as either a national security issue or an issue of, of foreign aggression in which we're about to be invaded, and actually look at the, at, the, at, the, at the really important questions of sustainability in an age of climate change and in an age of huge indebtedness of all of these countries, huge fiscal problems, so that they can actually address the real concerns of their people. That's, that, I think, is it's what's vitally important. And all the other things, we, we really have to, uh, to, to push aside and, and stop the spinning because it's, it's not helping anyone uh, in the region itself. Uh, Mr. Gedamu, what do you make of that? Are we any closer to, um, to that kind of an agreement that we just have not been able to reach in years? I think there is a huge potential for um, you know, reaching an agreement for all the three parties, uh, the Sudanese, Egyptians and Ethiopians. Because... What we have, what we have now, is a very much, you know, close to completion. We can say about sixty percent um, uh, of the project is believed to be complete. Uh, that's number one. Number two, the Sudanese actually consider this this project a blessing because it actually limits the amount of water flow that is to be very much damaging. So the only uh, part, the, the, the only party in this that's not very much happy is the Egyptians. And that's very much understandable. Just like uh, uh, both of uh, friends here said, um, it's very much understandable because it's water. It is a matter of existence for Egypt. We all understand that. But at the same time, there is always a way to move forward. And that's basically by understanding what is the interest of the others. Sure. Right? And not only just comparing the interests of the other countries with yours, but also respecting this interest. And one thing that I can actually say is that we all remember in the Mohammed, uh, Mohammed Morsi era, that's openly televised discussion, I think that was by mistake, 
um, that actually you know, led to some Egyptian opposition leaders and government officials suggesting bombing and uh, other yes. military actions. There is one fact. The only sol solution for this problem, right, if we call it a problem, is that very much diplomatic and coming around the table. And sometimes, right, compromising. And one thing is also very much sure. Of course, the media and the pundits, we all can talk about the possibility of water war. But there is one very much natural reason that will not let you know, such, such an issue to be from becoming very much a challenge. Because Ethiopia owns, or at least 85% of Nile waters comes from Ethiopia. And if there is a country that would like to attack this, this country, which yeah. actually owns 85% of the water, right, you could but attack ownership, and devastate certain sure. projects. Mr. Gatham, but, well, the, but you know, the ownership of the a water is actually, solution. yes, it does originate in Ethiopia, but the ownership is not so black and white. I want to go to uh, Mr. Carl Das. It is, um, there is a new era, it's a new prime minister in Ethiopia. Are you hopeful about that, Mr. Carl Das, and that um, we can possibly see an agreement between Egypt and Ethiopia because of the new leadership in Ethiopia? I think that the tone of the conversation has improved in the last year, and with the arrival of the new prime minister, there has been a constructive tone to uh, the talks that have taken place. That said, we haven't seen anything concrete come of those talks uh, as of yet. And so it's hard to be too optimistic because ultimately there's also a question of interest and leverage, right? The Egyptians don't really have much leverage in this conversation. They have requests that the Ethiopians can either accommodate and compromise on or not. But the leverage available to the Egyptians to pressure them is pretty limited. And uh, that's been part of the challenge that we've seen over the last several years. Um, there's no denying that there's some, I just want to touch on this issue of spin. I, 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 I think I reject that term pretty strongly in terms of what I've been saying. It's not spin to say that this is an urgent matter uh, about Egypt's agriculture and access to water. Um, it's certainly true that Egypt could use its water more efficiently. It's certainly true that different people benefit from that water to different extents and that um, and that, in general, the economy of Egypt is not exactly equal in, uh, by, any, uh, by any measure. But, uh, but uh, that doesn't take away from the, the national concern of, uh, of access to water and the importance of this issue to Egyptians uh, uh, of all types uh, and from all walks of life. So I, I think that it's, it's incorrect to, to go so far as to call it spin to raise the national interest uh, when it comes to this issue. All right, Mr. Um, Kaldas, we don't have a very long left in the program, but I'd like to ask a very brief question to all of you. Mr. Verhoeven, I'll go with you first. Do you think that the dam will be completed and will the you know, common interests prevail over the competition for water? Well, I think the dam will certainly be, be completed. The, the real question is, Eden, on, on what kind of terms? I mean, the dam itself, it's worth, it's worth reminding us of this, was explicitly built for regional integration. This dam is not built for production for the Ethiopian market. It's explicitly built for, for electricity to be exported to Sudan, to South Sudan, to Egypt, maybe to Eritrea, maybe even further afield. So Ethiopia itself has a major stake, not only in making sure that the transition agreements about, uh, about the impounding period are All right, respected... Mr. Beethoven. <laughs> And and are, I, I, are, clear, are, are clear, but so, but very, very, very importantly as well, that the the price of the electricity at which it's sold is in the interest of everybody. It is affordable to everybody. So in that sense, I think that yes, Ethiopia will 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 reach out and will right. try to compromise. Thank you very much. Uh, so yes or no answer from Mr. Gedamu and uh, Mr. Kaldas. Mr. Gedamu, what do you think? Uh, no doubt, I have no doubt that, the, that right. this project will be completed because. It's now it's I mean a huge responsibility for the sure. prime minister and okay, has, to that, has to deliver that. All right, Mr. Kaldas, the last word to you here. Yeah, I have, I have no reason to doubt that it will eventually be completed. Okay, thank you all very much uh, for your time. That is Timothy Kaldas in Istanbul, Johannes Gedemu in Georgia, and Harry Verhoeven right here in Doha. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Elizabeth Puranam, and the whole team here, bye for now.